بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh brother Mustafa we are studying chapter that deals with well brother Abu Malik Talking about the prayer. It's like well, uh, we're all talking about the prayer. We've been talking about prayer for the past couple of months now. Brother Muhammad, Condition conditions of, of salah. salah. See, it, it helps you to focus once you know what you're doing because it's, it, it, it relates things to, uh, uh, to the other things. So uh, the hadith we have here is hadith number 166 by Amir ibn Rabi'a. May Allah be pleased with him. Brother Malik, would you please read it for us? Narrated by Amir ibn Rabi'ah, radiallahu anhu. I saw Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa praying while mounted on his riding animal, facing whatever direction it faced. Al-Bukhari added, making gestures with his head, and he did not do that, meaning uh, pray while mounted with oblig uh, obligatory prayers. So this answers the questions we had previously. That is it okay to pray obligatory prayers while riding on uh, a camel or riding in our cars? And this answers it, that the Prophet did not do this except with voluntary uh, uh, prayer. Now, again, we come to this issue just uh, as a revision. Facing the Qibla is one of the conditions of Salah. Obligatory prayer, you have to face the Qibla. In voluntary prayer, you may not face the Qibla as the doing of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, 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 shows us that he did not do it. Now, the question is, Mustafa, do you think that in obligatory prayer, in, uh, sorry, in voluntary prayer, when I'm riding on my ride, whether it's wheels or, or camel or whatever, do I have to face the Qibla to say the first takbir, Allahu Akbar? then wherever it goes, it's okay, or it's open all the way? I don't know. Abu Malik? It's open all the way. It's open all the way, though some scholars say no. Takbiratul Ihram, you should face the Qibla, make takbir, then wherever your ride goes, your plane, your, your car, then uh, you're okay, but there isn't, according to what I know, a strong evidence that backs this uh, up. Abu Malik? Yeah. Uh, Somebody's driving a car. How do they pray and take care of the road at the same time? You don't have to pray to take care of the road. I've got, I know a lot of people that don't pray and don't give uh, a damn to what's happening in front of them. We have lots of reckless drivers. And believe me, this is a serious issue. And I don't want to, you know, distract myself from it, of it, but the number of fatalities, the number of road accidents, taking place in the Muslim world is un unbelievable. People don't pay any attention to human lives. Their carelessness, they're not abiding by the laws and by the speed limit and by the age. You get kids like 12, 13 years driving. This is all a sin. It's forbidden and it's unacceptable. To go back to your question, if a person is driving, see, you are driving and reciting the Quran. And the Prophet used to gesture, you know, when he wants to bow, he does this. When he wants to uh, prostrate, he does this. So you, your, eye, your eyes are still on the road if you're driving and you, you wish uh, to pray. But if you're not driving, then this is much easier. Remember that voluntary prayer is much easier than obligatory prayer. You may not face the qibla. You may not be standing up. You may not be looking where you should prostrate. And you may pray by or with gestures. So it, it can be done. Most of us, while driving, talk. And we can, you know, uh, argue in things and, and, and have conversations with, with the passengers. And that does not affect our uh, driving abilities and capabilities. Uh, what else? Now, uh, also in this hadith, uh, Brother Mustafa? Yeah, but isn't there uh, a, a, a different narration for Abu Dawood 
It says that first the Prophet used to face the Qibla with his Naqa and then he says Allahu Akbar and then he lets it direct in any, point in any direction. I have half of the knowledge with me here, which is I do not know. I, I cannot tell you. What I know is that a, num a group of scholars said that you have to face the Qibla and then you go onwards. But to my recollection, I don't recall if there's authentic hadith or not. Probably, inshallah, next time we meet, we will look into it and, and, and try to find it. And maybe we'll find it here somewhere or, or, or the other. It says here by Abu Dawood. Yes. Uh, can you read it for me, Brother Mustafa? Uh, narrated Anas in another narration of the hadith reported by Abu Dawood. When he وسلم, traveled and intended to pray a voluntary prayer, he used to direct his riding camel towards the Qibla, say Allahu Akbar, and pray facing whatever, whatever direction it, is face, it faced. Okay, this also, uh, uh, did we read this? No, we didn't read this. Who didn't read this? Okay, I'll, uh, three marks are taken away from you. Okay, then this hadith reiterates the fact that some scholars have. But again, I have to go back to my references and check if this hadith is authentic or not because at, as we stand I don't have any recollection of it so we have to, I have to go back to my references inshallah next time we meet I'll have it with me inshallah uh, azza wa jal. nevertheless if you can if you're able to do this okay but if in the case you are flying or in the case you are on a bus and, and, and the, the car is going in a direction different than the Qibla, it would be probably difficult for you to do so. So um, we have to go back and ensure that this is the correct uh, uh, virgin and authentic uh, virgin. Uh, what else? Now, this hadith tells us that the Prophet ﷺ used to make 100% use of his time because you travel for days and nights. Now, do we do the same? Do we make use of our time when we travel? If you travel in air, airplanes nowadays, they came up to the point that they brought movies and music to accompany you for five or six hours while you're traveling and flying, or maybe more. If you're going to the Far East or to the, to the West, the Far West, you probably uh, mounts up to 11 or 12 hours of flying. And they bring you the latest movies, the latest music, everything that you want to do except things that connect you to Allah. And it's very strange the amount of, you know, ghafla, the amount of unawareness of people <coughs> of, their, of their Lord Allah, the Almighty. You are stranded between the skies and earth. There's a very big possibility you're plane is going to crash. Lots of people had uh, uh, plane crashes and died in it. So why you, you, do you think that you would be safe from having such an incident? And nevertheless, the people don't have any fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. While they're flying, they watch movies, they enjoy themselves, they listen to music, they have fun, and none of them even think of praying. I remember once I had a, a, a flight to Vienna, Austria, and the flight started at late night, and in midair, Fajr dawn, uh, uh, Fajr prayer was was due, and all those in the aircraft were mainly Muslims, and to my surprise, until we landed, not even one single person stood up and prayed, and they're all Muslims. This is strange. This is awkward. Prayers should be in our blood. We, we should not abandon prayer under any circumstances. And yes, to answer the question you're thinking of, there was a place for people to pray. And there was enough place and space. But the problem is Satan comes to you and says, listen, you're going to Europe. And you're going for vacation to have fun. If you stand up and pray, what, all would, what would all these people say about you? Look at this primitive. Look at this retard. He's praying. Who prays nowadays? We're going to the place where we can have liquor and booze and, and, and women and gambling and have fun. 
that we're going to the place that no one will consider us as Muslims. So why pray? Before I, I last flight I came in, I was traveling to an Arab country, and unfortunately, in the plane, the women that went in, they were all covered in veil and black uh, uh, dresses, and you know, they, they, they looked very nice, you know, you couldn't see anything of them. And the minute the, uh, the aircraft was airborne, they went to the bathrooms, and they came out with their jeans, tight jeans, and shirts, and, and, and perfume, and, and, and blonde hair. And what the hell is happening? Where, where is this? I thought that we were hijacked by UFOs or something, and they were transformed, and these are aliens, and, and started uh, shaking hands with them. What is this? They said, well, we're going for a vacation. Okay, do you have a vacation from Islam? You have a vacation from work. You have a vacation from your uh, 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 commitment to school or your university. But you don't ever have a vacation from your religion and from your beliefs unless you are not a believer. Unless it's a matter of habit. Once we have the habit, we are Muslims. Once we are away from those who are looking at us, then we are not Muslims anymore. So this is a serious thing. When you're traveling, you should always connect yourself with Allah Azza wa as the Prophet did Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. The following hadith, hadith number 167. Narrated Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, may Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the whole earth is a mosque except graveyard and a toilet. Uh, can you repeat that again? The whole earth is a mosque to pray on? Except a graveyard and a toilet. And a toilet. Now, this is what I don't like about translation. The wor Arabic word is hammam. And they've translated it into toilet. Did the Prophet and the companions have toilets? No. So, how this translation translates to toilet? Then what, what was meant by toilet? Toilet? <coughs> no. A place where you relieve yourself? Yes, but they didn't have any hammam. Hammam in Arabic means, you know the Turkish, Turkish uh, uh, bath? Where a big pool with hot water and people rubbing uh, uh, people's backs and cleaning them. It's mm -hmm. Turkish or Syrian or Moroc Moroccan. In some countries, it's found. It's a general place for bathing. Uh, we have to pause here. Inshallah, after the break, we will continue talking about hadith uh, that we have just heard. So stay tuned. <laughs> program, insha'Allah, we'll be discussing the major sins in Islam, the way that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had taught us. Why the neighbor does not care about their neighbor anymore? Why does the father does not care about the son anymore? Why does the mother does not care about her daughter anymore? There's major sins that we need to be very far away in our lives so we could get and get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obtain the pleasure of Allah azza wa jalla. As long as we commit those major sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be too pleased from us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish those who commit those major sins. Keep away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forbidden and you'll be the closest worshipper to Allah azza wa jal. It is our duty in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep away from what Allah azza wa jal had forbidden. As when we commit those sins, especially those major sins, remember you are displeasing your Lord and you are bringing upon the curse and the anger of your Lord upon you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah and welcome back. Just before the break, we had the hadith uh, that stated Abu Sa'id al-Khudri's hadith where he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said the whole earth is a mosque to pray on except a graveyard and a toilet. And we said that the Prophet did not have a toilet so the translation is wrong. The word hammam means a public bath 
where people did not have bathrooms in where they lived, so they go to a, a, a common bath where they bathe in. It, the, the, the water is hot, and sometimes maybe they get a back scrub or, or so. The Prophet says in this hadith that it's not acceptable. Graveyards, okay, we understand, but hammam, why? Some scholars say because usually the, the people are exposed there, and maybe one would not wear a towel or cover his aura properly, but the hadith itself is not authentic. So we don't have to go, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot out of our way to try and elaborate and explain this hadith, though the meaning is acceptable. And also, similarly, it is not preferable for us to pray in places that are not uh, modest and respectable, such as uh, uh, bars, such as churches, such as uh, nightclubs. We should not honor these places by praying in them as it is not the suitable place uh, uh, to pray in. Mustafa. Um, what about uh, mosques that have graves in them? There are certain mosques that I believe have graves in them. Well, this is <coughs> a, a very a good question. The rule is that any mosque that contains a graveyard or a grave, prayer in it is void and unacceptable. This is crystal clear and it's, it's understandable. But the question is, what should we do if we have a mosque with a grave in it? Okay, how can we correct this error? Now, prayer in it is unacceptable. So how can we correct this error? What do we do? Do we, you know, uh, 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 destroy the mosque? Or do we take out the grave? Fadi? I don't think we can take out, out the grave because this will be disturbing of the dead. And uh, if we could, be, like, take down the mosque and build somewhere else, that's okay, but it's going to be very costly. So the best solution would be just perform walls or a different room for the grave for, and try to isolate as much as possible from the mosque. Okay, Abu Malik? Scholars said that uh, what was put in first stays. Okay, and that is correct. Whatever came first stays. So if a person died and we buried him, and then later on people came and said, let's put a mosque, build a mosque on top of his grave, then the mosque has to be destroyed. And if the opposite is true, that is, the mosque was built, and after a while, someone died, and we brought his body and bur buried him <coughs> in the grave, then he should be dug out and buried somewhere else. So this is uh, uh, the most authentic of all opinions. Brother Mustafa. So what about uh, Prophet Muhammad's uh, uh, grave? Yes. What about Prophet Muhammad's grave? Fadi. Uh, Prophet, so Prophet Muhammad was buried in his house, in his, in, at, at his home, and the mosque was closed by, he had doors opening. In a certain year of time, the, the mosque was being expanded, 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 till by mistake it included the house of the Prophet inside the mosque. So, so therefore, he, he was not buried in the mosque. He was buried in his house, which included the mosque at the end. That's the answer to your question. The Prophet ﷺ, when he died, he was not buried in the mosque. He was buried in the house of Aisha. And that is why the Prophet uh, companions, may Allah be pleased with them, when they had a dispute among them, the Prophet is dead. So they didn't know whether to take his body and bury him in Al-Baqir or what to do with it. So one of the companions came and said that I've heard the Prophet ﷺ say, that prophets of Allah, whenever they die, they are buried where they're dead. So he died on his bed, dig under it, and bury him in the house of Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. After 40 or 50 years in the Umayyah uh, reign, one of the uh, uh, rulers of Umayyah wanted to expand the mosque. So he included the house of the Prophet, alayhi salatu in the, in the expansion. 
Now the scholars tried to stop him, but he had all the gunpowder around. He had all the authority, so they could not say anything, or they cannot do anything, because they were, they were hopeless, or they, they, they were helpless. They could not do anything to change the situation. And that is why, if you go to the mosque of the Prophet, you will find that this is the direction of the Qibla, and this is the room where he was buried. But inside the room, you will find three triangular wall. So the, the room is surrounded by a triangle, and the tip of the triangle is to those who are trying to pray to the room. So if this is the Qibla and you come and try to pray to the room, you cannot be facing the room because to face the room, you have to be either this side or this side or giving it back to the Qibla. And then you are not facing or praying to the room. And this is an exception that cannot be, you cannot do anything else. You want us to dig the Prophet Sallallahu grave? This is completely blasphemous. No one can do this. Now, you want us to uh, uh, destroy the area where the mosque is, where the Prophet Sallallahu room is included, then people around the Muslim world would accuse you of being a Wahhabi, of being all sort of names and, and gestures, and this is not logical and that's acceptable. It was there for the past hundred well thirteen hundred years plus it will stay there but other than the Prophet ﷺ, no one has any uh, uh, secrecy no one is sacred so you can take their graves out if it came after the mosque was built and unfortunately nowadays we have lots of rulers building their mosques and saying to the people that when I when we die bury us in the mosque and this is forbidden this is unacceptable at all couldn't they like in in medina just like just not just remove the little part where you, you know when you go out and the the grave is on your left only this little part the exit like change the exit <coughs> so the, and, and then just so the and for, for put a wall so the the great the house of the prophet or the, his burial wouldn't be inside the mosque just a little bit, the, bit. the problem is that you cannot change anything in medina the, the people will not accept it and they will s consider this to be a, an act of blasphemy. The Prophet himself وسلم, did not do certain things because the people were not ready. As in the Bukhari in Muslim, where he says والسلام, to Aisha, just because your people are, were not, uh, they're newly Muslim, they were close to Kufr and Jahiliya, just because of this, Otherwise, I would have destroyed, or uh, um, destroying is not the word, I would have, you know, uh, uh, rebuilt the Kaaba and made it on the same pillars of Abraham. This means that he would have enlarged it, alayhi salatu salam, and I would have made two doors, one for the people to enter from and one for them to exit. So what stopped you, Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi salam? He said, because your people are not ready. Their <coughs> minds are not capable of grasping and comprehending this. It would have, you know, be too insultive for them. Abdullah ibn Zubair, when he ruled Mecca, he did this. And he did exactly what the Prophet ﷺ wanted to do. When he was killed and Hajjaj came, he again uh, rebuilt it and made it as it was. And then when uh, 10 or 15 or 100 years later, one of the caliph wanted to rebuild it again as the Prophet ﷺ wanted to do it. One of the a'imma said, don't do it. Because now people are, you know, ridiculing with the Kaaba. One builds it and one dismantles, well, takes part of it off and one adds something to it. And this is not the way it's supposed to be. So you cannot change much in Medina because you have 1.7, 1.8 billion people that <coughs> believe in Mecca and Medina and anything you do, even if you are following the Sunnah, even you're doing, if you're doing the right thing, they would consider this to be as uh, uh, blasphemous and they will not accept it. So the harm you're getting out of it is more than the benefit. Of course, the benefit is to get the wall back again so that the room 
and the house of the Prophet ﷺ is out of the mosque. There's no doubt in that. But you cannot do this. If you do this, all the Muslims and the hooligans and those who have uh, uh, hidden agendas would come out and say, ah, look at them, they don't like the Prophet, they don't follow the Prophet, they do this, they do that, and they start cursing and doing things that are not uh, uh, true and correct. So the Hadith talks about the graveyards, the cemeteries, and talks about the public baths, telling us that it is not uh, allowed for us to pray in these areas. The Hadith is not authentic, as mentioned before. Uh, going to the public baths it's, is not a recommendable thing because lots of aura uh, are exposed there, especially for women. It's forbidden for women to go to these uh, public places and take off their clothes, though there are only women, but they will be exposing their bodies, and this is forbidden. A woman should protect her body so that no one else would look at her. The same thing, a man is supposed to protect his body that no one else looks at him, at his aura, and to have these things protected. Uh, as far as the cemetery, some scholars say that this is forbidden simply because uh, in a cemetery, the soil itself is impure. Why is it impure? Because of the remains of the dead people. So the remains of dead people makes it impure. Is this correct? No. No, it's not correct. So why isn't it recommendable for us to pray in cemeteries? Because we don't want to pray for the dead. You know, you may have people coming and praying, though they're praying to Allah Azza wa but they pray to have their wali, their imam, their sheikh in front of them, and this is not acceptable. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time, Fadi, for your question, um, but until we meet next time, inshallah, we'll try to go through these topics once again. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.